Hello fish farmers and prospective fish farmers. My name is Marjita Mufukare and today we are at Hillcrest Farm. So today we're going to be focusing on stocking of fingerlings and also general good aquaculture practices. So firstly, I'd like to talk about biosecurity. As you see around the site, we've got a fence. So that's the first biosecurity measure that any site should have. So the reason for this is that we do not want to be transferring or we do not want any pathogens or diseases outside the site to be coming in. So physical barriers such as a fence will aid in this. And then secondly, any equipment that is used at the fish farming site or any equipment that is used for feeding the fish, for transferring the fish, should be cleaned afterwards and then stored properly and should not be used for any other purposes other than for what they are meant for on the fish farming side. This is also to prevent transfer of any diseases or pathogens from another site to our, to our fish ponds. So the fingerlings that we're going to be stocking today are from Lake Harvest and Kariba Brim. We're going to stock 2,000 fingerlings from Kariba Brim, which we're going to put in two ponds, and 2,000 fingerlings from Lake Harvest, which we're going to put in the other two ponds. Today, the ponds that we're going to be stocking, uh, we've got four ponds. Uh, each of the ponds are 20 meters by 10 meters, which is 200 square meters. And in each of the ponds, we're going to be putting 1,000 fingerlings. So this comes out to five fish per every square meter. So you will notice that um, I'm talking about uh, the surface area, which is square meters and not the volume of the pond. This is because if you're not going to be aerating, if you're not going to be um, introducing any other um, oxygen into the pond other than that which the pond can make itself, then when we're stocking the pond, we should just consider the surface area because this is the surface that the pond has to make the oxygen that will sustain the fish. If we talk about the volume, then we're also including the depth, but the depth, uh, the pond does not have any capacity to be able to make um, oxygen uh, with the depth. But if we're going to be using aerators, maybe if we're going to be using an air compressor, then we can talk of the volume. But without these interventions, then the stocking density should be calculated using the surface area of the pond. So in these ponds, we're going to be putting 1,000 fingerlings, five fish per, per square meter. Uh, so you will see these barriers. Uh, these are so that frogs do not come into the pond. Uh, there's always a problem of tadpoles in the pond. So the first measure that you can put in is to put these physical barriers so that the ponds, um, so that the frogs do not come and then lay their eggs in the water, uh, which would then create the problem of the tadpoles. Um, but if the tadpoles are already in the water, then um, one way of dealing with them is to physically uh, take them out using a, a scoop net. So in most cases, the tadpoles will be around the edges or they will crowd around one area. So you then just come in with the net and just scoop them out and then throw them outside. Uh, do this as often as you can, taking out as many as you can. Uh, the problem with tadpoles is that they will, when they are in the tadpole stage, they will also be using up oxygen uh, in the pot and they will also feed on the feed that you introduce. So both are disadvantages of having tadpoles in the water. And we also have those strings uh, with the black plastic hanging um, across the pond. So these act as bed scarers. Uh, when they are flapping in the wind like they are now, this will chase away birds. This is one method of doing it. Another way that you can use is putting a bed net on top of the water. So the bed net will be, will be uh, spread right across the surface of the water. Uh, this will prevent any birds from catching fish that are, that are in the water. So birds are especially a problem when the fish are at the fingerling size. The fish are still small uh, and certain birds can pick up the fingerlings very easily. And this will affect the numbers, uh, the number of fish that the farmer puts in if birds eat 10 or 20% of those, 
then already the survival rate has uh, has declined to levels that will make the project unprofitable so it is very important to have those measures in place so to as to prevent birds from from eating the fingerlings so when you decide that you want to start farming fish there are three critical success factors that you need to consider the first one is your source of water um, anyone who wants to venture into fish farming should have a reliable source of water and uh, this source of water should be able to sustain uh, the production cycle which is generally about six months or longer so the source of water should be able to supply water in case there is need to exchange the water remove dirty water and put in clean water the source of water should be able to do that so this is one thing that a farmer should be should be aware of and then the second issue is that um, you need uh, a good source of fingerlings uh, when I say a good source of fingerlings, I'm talking about the genetics. So it is important to source your fingerlings from a hatchery that is following a genetic program um, successfully. So the reason why this is important is that if you get fingerlings that do not have good genetics, that do not grow well, no matter how clean your water is, no matter how much feed you give them, they will not grow as expected because of their genetics. So it's important to get fingerlings from a reputable uh, from a reputable source and also the third critical success factor is nutrition so without nutrition like any other husbandry husbandry you need um, a good feed uh, so that your fish uh, grow properly uh, so nutrition also plays a key role to the success of the farmer so you've um, uh, you've got your source of water, you've got the nutrition in place. Today we want to focus on the stocking or the placing of fingerlings in the ponds. Um, also this can be in ponds, it can be in tanks or it can be in, in cages. Uh, generally the procedure is the same, uh, whichever production system that you're, that you're going to be using. Uh, so you've, um, you've sourced your fingerlings, um, the supplier should know or should be aware of how many kilometers you're going to be traveling or how long you're going to be in transit this is important so that they know how many fingerlings to put in each bag um, the number of hours that you're going to be spending in transit will guide the number of fingerlings that they're going to be placing in each of the bags for example if you're going to be travel for 16 hours and the fingerlings are let's say 0 0.5 grams then they can um, put 500 fingerlings in each bag. But if you're going to be traveling for, let's say, 24 hours with the same size of fish, then uh, the 500 will be too many. There'll be need to reduce the fingerlings to say 250 fingerlings per bag. Because once the bag is tied, the only oxygen that is available for the fish is the oxygen that is inside the bag. So the longer the fish travel, uh, they will consume all the oxygen and they will die because of, because of lack of oxygen. And also, it is important when you get to the site where you're going to be placing the fingerlings, first thing you do is to put the bags on top of the water without opening the bags. So you just place the bags on top of the water and you leave them for 15 to 20 minutes. So this is so that the temperature inside the bag, the water temperature inside the bag is the same as the water temperature inside the pond. So remember in the plastic bag, when we are packing, we will put um, about seven liters of water, the fingerlings, then, then oxygen, and then tie at the top. So seven liters is not a lot of water. While in transit, this water can increase temperatures very easily. So now we want the temperature inside the bag to be almost the same as the temperature inside, um, inside the pond. So by just placing the bags on top of the water, the temperatures will gradually, gradually acclimatize to the pond water. Uh, key here is the word gradual. We do not want any sudden changes because the sudden changes will stress the fish. So the process has to be gradual. This is why we leave them for the 15 to 20 minutes. So once this process is complete, um, then untie the bag and then gently let the fish swim out. So you'll find that most of the fish will swim out uh, where there's more oxygen, where there's fresh water, they'll happily swim out. And then there'll be a few fish that are left inside. These will need to be gently encouraged to then also swimming to, into the pond. 
So in most instances, we encourage farmers to not feed uh, on the day that they place their, their fingerlings. This is because the fingerlings in most instances will be stressed after, after traveling. And we just want them to acclimatize to their new environment and for the stress to relieve before we introduce feed. But if, for example, you've traveled for 30 minutes and your fish have not encountered any challenges during transit, you can then immediately, um, after placing the fingerlings in the water, uh, put in the feed, just a bit of feed. Um, the fish, if they're not stressed at all, they will feed. But why we encourage farmers to wait the day is, uh, in most cases, the fish will be stressed and they will not feed well. So that first feed will just be wasted. The next morning, the fish will be very hungry and they will be in much better condition and they will start feeding. So we generally advise farmers to then start feeding the next morning after placing their fingerlings in the water. So when farmers are buying their fingerlings from their, from their hatcheries or from their supplier, it is important for the farmer to know if the fingerlings are sex reversed or not. Sex reversed fingerlings are 99% male or all male fingerlings. It's important for a farmer to know this because male tilapia fingerlings grow faster than females. So a farmer who wants to just focus on production to say I want my fish to grow as quickly as possible and then I take them out, it is important for them to get sex reversed fingerlings. So you should also inquire from your hatchery or supplier if the fingerlings are sex reversed. Uh, some suppliers, they sell mixed fingerlings. So if a farmer decides that they want fingerlings that breed, um, they can get the mixed breed fingerlings. But the disadvantage of this is that, like I said earlier, uh, female tilapias, they grow slower than the males. So that is the first disadvantage. And then the second disadvantage is that when they start breeding now, you will have uh, your parent stock, the original, and then you'll have um, different sizes of fish in the same pond. Uh, this means that number one, you do not know the number of fingerlings that are in the pond, which makes it very difficult for you to calculate the feed that you're supposed to be giving them. And also number two, uh, all the fish will be at different stages in terms of feeding. Some of them will be eating starter two, some of them starter three, some of them grow. So it also makes feeding complicated because there will be fish of different sizes in, in the same pond. So you have introduced your fingerlings to your pond or your cage or your tank. Uh, next step now is feeding. Um, so it is important when you put your fingerlings inside the pond for you to record anything that happens after that stage. So you should have your book or if you're going to be using your computer, you should have your spreadsheet. The first information that you record is the source of your fingerlings. Uh, you, we also want to know the size of the fingerlings, the initial size of the fingerlings, and also the date when the fingerlings were stocked in the pond. So the fingerlings have been stocked in the pond, everything was done according to procedure, and you're now starting to, to feed your fish. So it is important to follow the feeding guide uh, that is um, provided by the feed supplier. So the feed supplier, they know the nutrition of the feed and how much uh, the fish require at each stage in its life. So it is very important to follow the guidelines that are given by the feed manufacturer. Uh, so the um, first thing that you do, for example, you've got your 1,000 fingerlings stocked in your pond. Uh, you calculate uh, depending on which feed you're starting with. Um, if the fish um, uh, from 0 0.5 grams to 1 gram, the first feed will be starter 1. If the fish are between 1 gram and 5 grams, the first feed will be starter 2. So I'll take an example that the fish are 1 gram and we're going to start with starter 2. So 1,000 fingerlings, they require 5 kgs of starter 2 for the first 3 weeks. This means that for us to calculate our daily feed, we'll say the 5 kgs divided by 21 days, we'll get our daily feed. But we also want to feed six times during the day. And these six times should be spread throughout the day. Uh, for example, if you say our first feed will be at 8 a.m., our last feed will be at, at 5 p.m., then we should spread the six feeds evenly uh, throughout those hours. 
So after calculating our daily feed, we then further divide that by six so that we get the amount of feed we should be giving at each time. Uh, so after calculating that feed, um, we recommend that feeding should be from the shallow end, especially when you're feeding the starter feeds and also pick one spot that you're going to be using for feeding. So this one spot is where you're going to be coming um, each of the times that you're going to be feeding and also each of the days. So the fish will learn very quickly where they get their feed from. By choosing one spot uh, that we're going to be using each time, uh, the fish will then be coming there all the time uh, for feeding. This will make our feeding uh, more efficient. Uh, for fingerlings that are very small, for example, fingerlings that are 0.2 grams, and if you're going to be stocking them in a big pond, then it is important to use harpers. So harpers are nets that are installed um, inside the pond. Uh, normally they are small, uh, two meters maybe by a meter or three or five meters by a meter. So these are put inside the pond and the fish are first introduced inside the harbor before we open up the harbor and let them swim freely in the pond. So the reason for doing this is that it makes feeding more efficient. Uh, the fish are very small and we're introducing them in a big pond which is maybe 50 meters by 20 meters. So it will be very difficult for fish that small to be able to find the, the feeding position. Uh, so by putting them in a harbor, we can feed them for the first two, three weeks while they're inside that enclosure, uh, making our feeding more efficient. And then we open up when they're a bit bigger so that they can swim freely inside the pond. So this is one way that farmers can use to make feeding more efficient, especially when the fingerlings are, are very small. So when choosing a feed for the fish, uh, it is important to get a floating feed. So the importance of a floating feed is that when the feed is floating, you can check to see if the fish are responding to the feed or not. Um, if uh, you uh, broadcast the feed and you see that after 30 minutes the feed is still floating on top of the water, this means that the fish are not responding to feed and therefore you should reduce the amount of feed that you're giving. But if you're broadcasting the feed and all of the feed is taken up very quickly, then it means that the fish are responding to, to feeding and they are eating very well. So by giving the fish floating feed, it is easier for the farmer to track uh, the fish's response to feed. So there are some factors that will cause fish not to feed well. Uh, those are the factors that I want to discuss next. So when you see that your fish are not feeding well, there are several reasons why this is so. Uh, the first reason and the most common reason is a decline in temperatures. So tilapia are warm water fish. They prefer water temperatures between 28 and 32 degrees Celsius. When our temperatures fall below this, and this suppresses their appetite. So the lower the temperatures go, their appetite is, is suppressed and they will not feed well. So even if the water quality is good, even if the quality of feed is good, but if the temperatures are too low, then our fish will not feed. So this is just one of the factors that causes our fish not to feed well. Second reason why our fingerlings might fail to feed is the quality of the feed. So if the quality of the feed is poor, then the fish will not take it up. So normally fish feeds have got um, a, a fishy smell because of the fish oil and fish meal that is put in the feed and this attracts the fish to come and feed. But if the feed does not contain these then um, fish might fail to, to be attracted to the feed and they will not feed very well. So this is also another factor that causes fish not to feed. And then the third factor is water quality. So the water is the environment that the fish live in. If the conditions are not optimal for the fish, the fish will be stressed. And when the fish are stressed, they do not feed. So for example, if our oxygen is below, let's say five parts per, per, per million, then the fish will not feed well because they do not have enough oxygen for them to be able to breathe and sustain their metabolic functions. So this is another reason why fish um, why fish fail to feed. So if um, the farmer goes to the pond, it's a sunny day and the water quality is good and the quality of the feed is also good, 
there is no reason why the fish should not be taking up taking up the feed um, so next we want to talk about water quality so like i said earlier the water is the environment that the fish live in so it is important for them uh, that we give them the best conditions so that they thrive um, and these best conditions are um, the oxygen in the water so oxygen in the water should be above 5 ppm so that the fish um, have enough oxygen for them to be able to breathe so how do we get oxygen in the water or how do we increase the amount of oxygen in the water so oxygen is introduced into the pond through two ways naturally the first way is the first way is when we have um, the wind or just the air passing over the surface of the water uh, when this is happening oxygen will naturally dissolve in the water and the oxygen that is dissolved in the water is now available for the fish to be able to breathe the second way is through photosynthesis so there is algae in the water this algae acts just like the trees that we have in our environment it produces oxygen through the process of photosynthesis so this means that whenever there is sunlight uh, the algae is making oxygen uh, this oxygen is then available for our fish to utilize but now with algae when it is during the night when there is no sunlight the algae now respires this means that it is now taking up oxygen and producing carbon dioxide so farmers should always be aware of the fact that when it is at night the algae will be also taking up oxygen and our fish will also be taking oxygen so there will actually be competition between the algae and the fish to utilize oxygen when there is too much algae in the pond uh, this means that more oxygen will be taken up and very little oxygen will be left for for our fish so farmers should always be careful of that balance um, algae is important it is a source of uh, food for the fish natural food for the fish it also produces oxygen for the fish during the day but at night now it uses up oxygen so farmers should uh, look out for algae bloom to make sure that there is not too much algae inside the pond uh, one way of doing this or the easiest way of doing this is uh, putting your hand in the water and then checking if you can still see your palm if you can see your palm clearly then it means that you might uh, actually need to add a bit more algae in the pond uh, but if you see just an outline of the palm then your water quality is good um, but if you cannot see your hand completely then it means that there is too much algae you need to drain out some of the dirty water and put in fresh water just to dilute the amount of algae inside the pond um, another very important uh, water quality aspect is temperatures i mentioned this earlier to say that um, tilapia is a warm water fish so they require water temperatures that are above 28 when our water temperatures have declined um, our fish do not just do not feed but they also become more susceptible to infections so you find that most of the diseases that affect our tilapia uh, during winter or just before winter or when we're just coming out of winter and this is because of um, of the low low water temperatures so there is a relationship between uh, water temperature and also oxygen in our pond when our water temperatures are high this reduces the ability of our water to hold oxygen so it means that when our temperatures are high um, the water will be losing oxygen at a higher rate and then when our water temperatures are low this increases the pond's capacity to be able to hold on to oxygen so on very very hot days uh, farmers should always remember that my pond today because it is very hot the ability of the water to hold on to the oxygen is reduced so on very very hot days reduce the amount of feed that you give to your fish because you know that the amount of oxygen that is in my pond is lower because of the temperatures 
um, and then reduce the feed so that the fish are not stressed by giving them feed when already they do not have enough oxygen to breathe. And when our water temperatures are lower, unfortunately because of the water temperatures the fish will not take up more feed but they will have more oxygen because the water body is able to hold on to to more oxygen so thank you so much for joining us today while we we're stocking our four ponds at hillcrest farm uh, we hope to have another session in six months when we're harvesting so that at least we can show the progression of the project